Welcome to Dove Point Bible Study. We're so glad you joined us, and today we will finish chapter 10 in the great Gospel of Mark, and we'll begin chapter 11. And from our last lecture, James and John have asked Jesus for a favor. They said, Please, Lord, grant unto us that we may set one on your right hand and one on your left hand when you come into your glory. Jesus said, You don't know what you're asking, boys. Because to set on my right hand and on my left hand is not mine to give. Ladies and gentlemen, in the glory, Jesus sets where? At the right hand of the throne of God. And, Christ, and on Christ's left hand sets who? God the Father. So there's no room for those guys there. However, Ezekiel chapters 40 and verse 48 through 48 does record where James and John, along with all of the rest of God's elect, will be, and what we will be doing after this particular dispensation of time and flesh is over. And it, and it states that through the millennial reign of Christ, the only people who will have direct access to Christ Himself are the elect of God. And that's a really good place to be when that next dimension of the Spirit rolls around. And that brings us to where we left off last time in your Bibles, Mark chapter 10 and verse 41. And when the other ten disciples heard it, they began to be much dis displeased with James and John. Oh yeah, here we go. So here comes the flesh. And here comes the jealousy. Worrying about who's going to be number one. And these are the twelve. Think about this. These are the 12 men that Jesus handpicked and chose to follow Him. Okay? The reason I bring this up is so you'll think about this. The next time that you get a little upset and aggravated and your flesh starts talking to you, you know what I'm talking about. <clears throat> You're not all by yourself, ladies and gentlemen. Even the disciples wrestled with it. So recognize what it is, just like they had to do, and grow up and get that out of you and get over it. Because if there's one thing that will really hold you back in life and hold you back from the kingdom, it's this very kind of stuff. Get rid of it. You don't need it. Verse 42, But Jesus called to him <clears throat> then and saith unto them, you know that they which are accounted to rule over the Gentiles, that's earthly kingdoms, exercise lordship over them. And their great ones exercise upon them. In other words, the kings and the prime ministers and the presidents of this, rule, of this world rule over the people of this world. That's what he's saying. But look at verse 43. But so shall it, say it with me, not be among you. But whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister. And the word minister in the Greek is diakonos, and it does not mean preacher. Okay? It means servant. That's what it means. The one who will minister to your needs, which means he is the one who will feed you the truth from the Word, and it is God that gives the gifts to those that can teach and lead. But it isn't their gift. No, no, no. It's God's gift. And that, quite frankly, is why it works. Verse 44, And whosoever of you will be the chiefest, who's going to be the top dog, shall be servant of all. In other words, if you are the top dog, you're going to be serving all of the needs of all of the people, not lording over them like the world system does, but serving the people. Now, who wants to be number one? Okay? In the kingdom, because that's what it takes. Verse 45. For even the Son of Man, who's the Son of Man? It's Jesus Christ in the flesh. Came not to be ministered unto, but to what? but to minister or to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. And this, my friend, is the difference between the governments of this world 
and the kingdom of God. The world leaders rule over the people, mostly with an iron hand, but the leaders in the kingdom of God are the servants of the people. Quite a contrast. Is he getting down on the disciples just a little bit here? I, I think he is. I do. He's telling them to get their head out of their flesh, okay, and bring their thinking up to a kingdom level. Get out of this earthly stuff. Where God can work His gifts through them. That's what He's dealing with them about. He's telling them to stay focused. Remember George Burr Sr.? Focus, focus. Focus on the kingdom. And stop worrying about what's in it for me. That isn't the way the kingdom works. What's in it for me, that's out. Or what your position is going to be. Oh, I want to be here. I want to be there. You know, you just need to serve God and let God place you. And don't forget His promise of the 100-fold return, not in heaven, but now in this time. We did all this last week. We covered this last week. For those who are all in for the gospel's sake and for Christ's sake, wherever your place is, doesn't matter hundredfold return. That's great return. 46. And they came to Jericho. And that's about 20 miles away from Jerusalem. And as he went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great number of people, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the highway side. All right? What, what was he doing? Say it with me. He was begging so he's, so he's not only blind, <laughs> but he's also a beggar, and he's on the side of the road, 47. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth that was coming, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And what does this tell you? It tells you that the man had faith. And he knows who Jesus is, and he knows what he can do. He knows he's from Nazareth. That's what he said. And he knows that he's the son of David. So he is not what? He is not biblically illiterate. If he knows those things, he's, he's studied. Verse 48. Now look, look, listen at the people around this poor guy in beggar's clothes. He's blind. He's sitting on the side of the highway. And look what the folks around him do. Verse 48. And many charged him that he should hold his peace. But he cried more, a great deal. Thou son of David, have mercy on me. He didn't let him stop him. He continued to yell. So the folks around the blind beggar, old blind Bartimaeus, want him to do what? They want him to just shut up. Why? No one in Jericho cares anything about this guy. That's why. He's old blind Bartimaeus. But not Jesus. Well, watch this. He's going to hear the blind beggar and call for him to be brought to him. What's he doing here? Demonstrating to his disciples what he had just taught them. That Jesus truly is the servant of all. And he's going to take the time to serve this blind beggar that no one in town seems to care anything about. 49. Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. And they called the blind man saying unto him, I can just see the disciples telling him this, Be of good cheer, man. Be of good comfort. Rise. He's calling you. The disciples are all excited for the beggar because they know what Jesus touches, He blesses. Mm -mm, and even today, listen to me, even today, He will call you if you will call out for Him. Do you need Him today? Then be like Brian Bartimaeus. Lord, I need some help. If you call, if, <clears throat> He'll call on you if you call out to him, verse 50, and he casting away his garment, 
rose and came to Jesus. Now, why did he cast away his garment? It's because he knew that when Jesus called for him, he wouldn't need that beggar's robe any longer. I ain't going to need this. Talk about faith. That man had faith. And here he goes. 51. And Jesus answered and said unto him, What will thou that I should do unto thee? The blind man said unto him, Lord, that I might receive my sight. 52. Now watch what Jesus said. And Jesus said unto him, Go thy way, thy what? Faith has made thee whole. And then what happened? And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus in the way. So now, Jesus is going to use him. And the man doesn't need that beggar's robe anymore. Why? He can see now, but not just physically, he can also see spiritually. He had his spiritual eyes opened. And he doesn't, and God, listen, God doesn't send out beggars. He doesn't have to. You know why? He doesn't use beggars, and he doesn't send out beggars. Because in Mark chapter 6 and verse 7, and Matthew chapter 10 and verse 9, when Jesus began to send the twelve apostles out two by two, he told them, listen to what he told them. He said, do not take an extra coat with you. Do not take an extra pair of shoes with you. Do not take any money with you. And do not take a script with you. Well, what's a script? A script is a beggar's bag. Don't take it, Jesus said. Why? Because when God, I said when God sends people out with His message, God Himself will speak to people and they will help you along the way. And when a servant of God gets the help that way, he or she absolutely knows exactly where it's coming from. It's coming from God. And the person who heard and obeyed God's voice is in for a huge, huge blessing. Now, in this time. So, God doesn't need beggars in His kingdom, and neither does He use them. Let's take a Lachim moment, shall we? Are you ready out there? Lachim! The life. And that concludes chapter 10 that is absolutely filled with deeper spiritual truths on several subjects. And if you missed it, you should go back and, and listen to that whole chapter. And if you didn't understand some of these things, you know what? That's okay. There were some pretty deep things in that last lecture. It's okay. Just put it in the back of your mind and let it rest right there a while and continue studying and that that is pure truth will come forth, I guarantee you. If you pray for that knowledge and that wisdom that your spiritual eyes be opened so that you can see the simplicity that is written in God's Word. And it really is simple when you understand it. I pray right now, if that's you and you want those spiritual eyes open, I pray that the eyes of your understanding will be opened and your heart be opened to the deeper truths of God. Amen. Now we start Mark chapter 11 and verse 1. And when they came to Jerusalem unto Bethpage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, okay, he sendeth forth two of his disciples. Now, Bethany okay, and Bethpage are the two villages that lie on the east side of the Mount of Olives. They're just small villages. So I want you to realize where we are standing in verse 1. It's very important. We're standing on top of the Mount of Olives. 
and straight west of the Mount of Olives lies the Kidron Valley that goes down and then up to Mount Zion, the Temple Mount. That valley is so steep, you can barely walk it. We've been there, and it's really hard to walk. And while standing on top of Mount Olives, and by looking straight, straight west, you are level with and looking at the eastern gate of the Temple Mount. And, at, and the Garden of Gethsemane lies at the very foot of the Mount of Olives in the Kidron Valley. So you've got the Mount of Olives. You go down to Gethsemane where he, where he had that, uh, that, that night. And then to get to the Temple Mount, you've got to go almost straight up and there was the Eastern Gate. Okay, that's where we're at. In Acts chapter 1, same spot, verses 9 through 12. Forty days after Christ's resurrection, he met one last time with his disciples. Where at? On the Mount of Olives. And it was from there that Christ ascended back up to heaven. Zechariah 14, verse 4, the prophet tells us that when Christ returns to the earth, his feet shall stand in that day upon what? Upon the Mount of Olives. So there is a lot of biblical history from this mountain and a lot more prophecy yet to be filled right here, okay, where Jesus and the boys were standing on top of the Mount of Olives. And by the way, we're going to see those prophecies fulfilled in our lifetime. Verse 2, And he saith unto them, Jesus is going to instruct these disciples. He saith unto them, Go your way into the village over against you, and as soon as you are entered into it, you shall find a colt tied, whereon never a man sat. Loose him and bring him to me. Verse 3, and if any man say unto you, all right, why do you this? Say you that the Lord hath need of him, and straightway he will send him here. Now, what does this tell you? Think about this for just a minute. He's telling them to go to a place they've never been to before, to a guy they've never met and ask for an animal that belongs to that guy. Okay, This is what he's telling them. But what does this tell you? It tells you that this man will have this colt ready because he knows someone's coming for it. You understand? He already knows. And this tells you that this was what? It was prearranged. By who? By Father God. So the owner of the colt already knew that someone, didn't know who, someone would be sent from the Lord coming to get this animal. And this had already been prophesied to happen in the Old Testament. And I assure you that the owner of this animal also knew this prophecy before he was visited by the Spirit of God that told him what to do. And by the way, this, time of, this type of thing happens even today, and it happens a lot if you're walking with God. In fact, what this is called, it's called walking in the Spirit. And this man was definitely walking in the Spirit. And this owner was what? He was ready and willing to do one thing, to serve God. Whatever He asks, I'm, I'm going to give it to Him. And where is this Old Testament prophecy found? I want you to turn to the book of Zechariah. It's just right, it's a book really close to right before the New Testament. And the reason I want you to turn there, and I've talked about this before, but I want to read these two scriptures. And I want you to underline them because I don't think most Christians even know this, what I'm getting ready to tell you. Now, I know 
the folks at Dove Point do, but there's a lot of people out there that don't know this. Zechariah chapter 9, I'll give you a little time to find it, and verse 9, and when you get there, that one verse in verse 9 is going to, it, it's, it's all about the first advent of Christ. These two verses, 9 and 10, are going to absolutely confirm that Christ would have a first advent and a second advent. From the Old Testament. Verse 9. Zechariah 9. And the first advent of Christ. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Underline it in your Bible. Highlight it. Don't ever forget this. It's a good thing to teach people. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh to thee. He is just, and having salvation, lowly, and riding upon an ass, and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. Now how much more specific can you get? Hundreds and hundreds of years before Christ was ever born. 600 about. And that's prophesying the first advent. And we just read it. It has been recorded. Okay? Now we get to verse 10. These are two very important scriptures. You're teaching your kids. You're teaching a friend. You're teaching somebody hungry that really wants to know. Listen, you can prove that there was a first and a second advent that was prophesied. Verse 10 covers the second advent and his second return. Here we go. And I will cut off the chariot. Oh, what chariot's that? It's the war chariot. From who? From Ephraim. Oh, who's Ephraim? Ephraim is the largest and the leader of the ten tribes of Israel. And he's talking about the time Christ returns. He said, I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim. And I will cut off the horse from Jerusalem. And the battle bow shall be cut off. In other words, any power that comes against Ephraim, the ten tribes of Israel, or Judah, on the day of Christ's return, will be utterly destroyed. And if you listen to the end time alignment of the nations, you know exactly how this happens. And if you haven't listened to this series, I would go back and listen to the end time alignment of the nations. In fact, this fall I'm going to be doing an addition to that, and I'm going to give you an update on that stuff, and, and it's, it's powerful stuff. But right here, he's telling you, yeah, they're going to come and try to wipe out Manasseh, they're going to come and try to wipe out little Judah, but they're not going to get it done. Let's listen to what Jesus said, what God said. And the horse from Jerusalem and the battle bow shall be cut off. Any power that comes against Ephraim or Judah on the day of Christ's return will be utterly destroyed. That's the United States and little tiny Israel in the Middle East. That's who he's talking about. And now watch what he does after he wipes the enemy out. He shall speak peace unto the heathen. A thousand years worth. That's a whole bunch. And that's actual time. A thousand years of actual time. And his dominion. Now what is the dominion? It's the king and what he dominates over. And his dominion, he's talking about Jesus, shall be from sea even to sea, and from the river even to the ends of the earth, and that is a dispensational statement that means to the ends of time He will rule forever. Hallelujah. So there you have it. The two advents of Christ prophesied in the Old Testament. Don't let, everybody, don't let anybody ever tell you it's not in there. We just read it. Now let's slip back to Mark chapter 11. Okay? Mark chapter 11 and we're going to look at verse 4. Are you enjoying that out there? Glory to God. I know I'm enjoying doing it. Let's do a Lachim one more time, shall we? Lachim! The life. I get all kinds of letters on the Lachim break. I know you like it, and I do too. <clears throat> Mark 11, verse 4. Now, from here on out, we're going to get into some pretty deep stuff here. So have your spiritual cap on. Thinking cap. Verse 4, And when they went their way, and found the colt tied by the door without, get this, in a place where two ways meet. 
Don't read over that. And they loosed him. One more time. And they went their way. They went to the little village and found the colt tied by the door without in a place where two ways meet. And they loosed the colt. Now, a place where two ways meet. All right? If you go to the companion, you'll find out that from the languages, this is, has some to do with the Aramaic language, <clears throat> the place where two ways meet actually means where one quarter of the little village meets another quarter. In other words, Jesus told them where to look for the donkey. Okay? Verse 5, And certain of them that stood there said unto them, what do you loosing the coat? And they said unto them, Even as Jesus had commanded, which was, The Lord has need of him. And they let him go. Yeah, they did. Why? The owner already knew. Everything lined up on the owner's end. Everything lined up on God's end and the disciples' end. And the coat was headed to Jesus. Now, <clears throat> so this was well orchestrated and well planned out on God's end and on the owner's end. Listen closely. God does not do things haphazard. He is a master planner. And as it is written, so shall it be done. But it's written first. And this is why you need to know the prophecies in your Bible so that you can know what tomorrow brings. Well, what good does that do me? I'll tell you what good it does, do, does for you. Then the fear of the, other, of the unknown is gone. It's taken away from you. And you can prepare yourself for those events. Ladies and gentlemen, there is nothing perchance with God. Nothing with men. Oh yeah, there's a lot of chance there. But not with God. It's all planned according to His plan. Everything was prearranged. Why? Why did He prearrange it? Listen to this. So that all of God's children would have every chance possible whereby they could read and then see His plan and come to repentance. That's what, just exactly what's going on here in this chapter. Verse 7, And they brought the colt to Jesus and cast their garments on him. And he set upon him. So he rides that colt into Jerusalem in a very peaceful way during his first advent. But I can tell you the next time he enters that city on an animal, it will be on a great white steed. And he will be coming as a Conquering king, not a lonely man on a donkey. And every knee is going to bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is King of kings and Lord of lords. Verse 8. And so what did the people do? And many spread their garments in the way. And others cut down branches of the trees and strawed them in the way. These would be mainly palm branches. Verse 9. And they that went before, and they that followed cried, Hosanna! Blessed is he that come in the name of the Lord. Now, Hosanna is Hebrew. That means save now. Or save us now. So they're yelling, save us now! Save us now! <clears throat> and the words they were saying and singing were the words of a prophecy that King David had written in Psalms 118. You can't get away from it. It's all laid out. 1,000 years earlier, this psalm was written. That's how they knew what to say and what to sing on this particular day. You'll see this in a moment. I'm going to read it to you. You don't need to turn to it. Psalms 118.24, this is what they said and they sang. This is the day that the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. <clears throat> 25. Save now 
I beseech thee, O Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, send now prosperity. Verse 26. Blessed be he that cometh in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you out of the house of the Lord. And this psalm states, now listen, it's a prophecy, that one day God would send a Savior and prosperity. And when He did, the people would say, Blessed be he that cometh in the name of the Lord. And that is exactly what the people are saying and singing as Jesus rides this colt through the streets of Jerusalem. It was prearranged by God right down to what the people would say and do as Jesus rode that colt through the streets of Jerusalem. Now listen closely. And Jesus is the Savior, and we must have the Savior first before we can have salvation or Hosanna before that's possible. Do you understand that? <clears throat> and here he is, even though the people don't understand it yet, what they're seeing. You'll see that in a minute. They're yelling this, but they don't really understand what's going on. Verse 10, <clears throat> And as the people continued and said, Blessed be the kingdom of our father David that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. <clears throat> so the people also know that the Messiah would be the offspring of David when He comes because they know the prophecy and the lineage of the Messiah through the prophecy in Isaiah, where is it at? Chapter 11, verses 1 through 5. You should read it sometime. They know. And Psalms 118, 24 through 26 had just became a reality before their very eyes, even though they didn't realize actually what was going on. Not yet. Just as we have many prophecies formulating right now in our generation, and most people don't see them. In fact, most of the prophecies of the Bible are being filled. 90% of them are being fulfilled in our generation. So, stay tuned, folks. I'm watching. I'm watching real good. And I will do my level best to keep you informed. That is what part of what God called me to do. Verse 11. <clears throat> and Jesus entered into Jerusalem and into the temple. He just walked right in. Well, why wouldn't He? It was His dad's house, right? <laughs> <clears throat> and when He had looked round about upon all things, and now the even tide was come, which means it's late in the day, and most of the folks have gone home, but he looks around at an empty temple and he sees a consorted mess inside the temple with the money changer tables and the feathers from the mite infested doves that were being sold as sacrifices that were anything but perfect. And the temple looks more like an auction house than it does the temple of God. But most were gone, and he went out into Bethany with the twelve. But he'll be back tomorrow, and I can tell you right now, the fur is going to fly. Okay? <clears throat> also at this time, Jesus is only days away from his crucifixion. Finish verse 11, and now eventide was come. And Jesus went out unto Bethany with the twelve. Now, I'm going to stop this lecture right there, and we'll pick it up right there next time. Okay? But I want to finish this lecture on the triumphal entrance of Christ. All right? <clears throat> so, what was it really that the people were joining in on but really didn't understand? Okay? That's a good question, right? It was a part, what was going on that day, was a part of the Feast of Passover celebration. You see, the things that were done in the triumphal entry of Jesus 
are the very things that had been done as a part of the temple service in the selecting of the Passover lamb every year for a thousand years. That's the day they chose the lamb, the perfect lamb. And David was the prophet who put all these prophetic shadow pictures in place. And now the son of David is fulfilling those holy rehearsals just as Israel had rehearsed them from the time that Solomon dedicated the first temple a thousand years before Christ. So they were used to cutting palm branches. You know, that's the day the lamb was picked. <clears throat> and that's when they shouted what, Psalms 118. <clears throat> so all the palm branches laid out on the street and the singing of Psalms 118, 118 happened every year for a thousand years. At Passover, in the selecting of the perfect Passover lamb. And yet nobody knows what's going on except Jesus. Stay with me. And on that particular year, it would be the spotless lamb from Bethlehem that is triumphantly paraded into the gates of Jerusalem as the Passover lamb who would take away the sins of the whole world, even though the folks didn't know that yet. <clears throat> you see, there's a mystery hidden in this triumphal entry of Christ. And in John chapter 12, that mystery of this entry is revealed, and I want you to turn to John chapter 12, and we'll finish right there. Because I'm going to lay something on you that most people don't know. But you're going to know when we get done. Gospel of John, chapter 12. <clears throat> and when you get there, look down at verse 12. This is John's account of this same day. <clears throat> On the next day, <clears throat> which is what day? It's the fourth day before the feast of Passover. It's the 11th of Nisan. Okay? There were much people that would come to the feast. What feast? The feast of Passover, of course. And they came from every nation around Israel. At least one male from every family that was Jewish had to come to Jerusalem on that, on that feast. Okay? When they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So the folks were already there. Thousands and thousands and thousands of Jewish people are there to celebrate Passover. When they get there, they're already there. And then they hear, hey, this guy Jesus, we've been hearing about him. He's coming too. Really? Yeah, he's coming. I can't wait to meet this guy. I heard a lot of things about him. I heard the blind eyes were open, crippled people were walking, the whole nine yards dead were raised. Yeah, that's what I heard too, Bob. Well, what do you think? I think he's coming to town. We need to go. Well, we're already here, Bob. Okay, let's wait for him. That's what's going on. Thirteen. And what they do? They took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him. Jesus. And cried, Hosanna! Blessed is the King of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. So, they're repeating Psalms 118 like they've done for a thousand years. And Jesus, when he had found a young ass set thereon, as it is written, 15, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, thy king cometh, setting on an ass's colt. Now, sharpen up real good for me right here. Here comes the mystery. Verse 16. These things understood not his disciples at the first. They didn't know what was going on. But when Jesus was glorified, when did that happen? When he was resurrected. They remembered that these things were written of him and that they had done these things unto him. Shazam! Now there you go. Right from the Word of God. They, did, they understood not what was going on right there at first. So the disciples 
<clears throat> didn't understand the triumphal entry of Christ until after he was resurrected. Nor did any of the, of the people who were there to see his triumphal entry. And that's the mystery. And it's a good thing that it happened just that way. And God had this whole thing planned all along. Now, I do want you to turn to one more scripture. I'm sorry, I lied to you all ago. <laughs> Actually, I just forgot. I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And again, you're going to hear some things you've never heard before, probably. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and when you get there, look down at verse 6. Paul is the one... <clears throat> who explains this mystery that we just studied tonight, and he explains it in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Verse 6, Paul speaking, How be it, we speak wisdom among them that are perfect. Now what does that mean? That means we speak wisdom among those who are mature in the Lord. That's what I'm doing now. We're talking about it. Yet not the wisdom of this world, nor the princes of this world that come to naught. They got a bad end coming. And who is the prince of this world? Satan. And who's the rest of the princes? His fallen angels. But we speak the wisdom of God, read the next three words, in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God, what, ordained, He set it up this way, before the world, before it ever got here, unto our glory. we got to see it. Verse 8. Which none of the princes, this is Satan and his fallen angel buddies, none of the princes of this world knew. Think about it. For had they known it, they would not, I repeat, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. They wouldn't have done it. Would have been checkmate for the devil right there. But he didn't know about it. So it was Paul who revealed this mystery that had been hidden from the disciples and hidden, hidden from the princes of this world and quite frankly all the people. And aren't you glad? For if they had known, if these princes would have known that the feast of the Lord, now I'm going to talk about the feast now, if they had known that the feast of the Lord are all prophetic shadow pictures of better things to come through Christ, they never would have crucified Him. And the plan of the Almighty would have been what? It would have been circumvented. But thank God it wasn't. Amen? And even though the disciples did not understand the prophetic ramifications of which was transpiring before their very eyes, a retrospective understanding of the temple services clarifies what Jesus was doing each day as He fulfilled the prophetic shadow pictures deeply embedded into the Passover. And as Inspector Clouseau would say, the mystery is a salvage. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the Gospel of Mark. And what a great book it is. Mm -mm -mm, and I hope you're enjoying it. And I'm going to tell you something. Between right here and the end of this book, it really gets good. Especially when we get to chapter 13. It's all about our generation. If you would like to write us, we would love to hear from you. Or if you would like any of our study materials that we've offered on YouTube since we've been on there. Right here is the address. And all of our literature is free. Okay? And don't miss the next lecture. As Jesus cleans out that temple of God, then... He gives us a lesson on the, get this, unlimited power. I said unlimited power of faith. And then, you'll like this, He teaches us the secret of answered prayer. Wouldn't you like to have that? I want me some of that. 
Don't miss it. It's that good. We thank you all for watching. Until next time, my friends, friends that we have now from all across the country, Shalom and Shalom.